Oh, I see, okay, I see a clock there. Um, so, uh, but please do, you know, actually, uh, after uh, I, sp in addition, I was gonna say, I'm gonna, I'm supposed to speak very briefly because we also wanna leave time for Joanna Blackman, Jared Lyle, and Justin Noble are each um, going to speak. Um, I don't know, if in, in that order? Do we know what the order? No, it'll be obvious. Okay, so Jared's kind of, um, and then both Trent Alexander, who has been working in the federal statistical system for the last seven years, um, and I will be um, around as well to answer questions. Um, the first thing I want to say, um, oh, here's our agenda. Um, so we'll talk first, so I'll talk about the, um, well, I'll talk about those things, and then um, Jared's going to come up and talk about ICPSR's interpretation of the OSTP memo, though I'm also going to address that a little bit. Um, we'll talk about government agencies, census, the census metadata repository, which I think Jared will also talk about, which is a great new um, collaboration that we are establishing with the um, U.S. Census Bureau. Um, and then we'll talk about the commission report and restricted data. So, I, um, And then ICPSR repositories for government data, um, which I think Justin will be discussing, um, Data Lumos in particular. So so what I'm going to say um, are just a couple, a couple things that are more kind of things. I don't know. It's so much fun being the director because you get to do things like stand up here and they do all the work, and I'm just going to stand up here and sort of pontificate a little bit about ways that I think we should think about um, these things. But just so that you have um, the links, and, and all these slides are posted, so that you have the links to the White House Office of Science and Technology um, policy memo from 2013, here it is. So you'll see it is, it is um, into, uh, as under the Obama White House archives, but these are, but basically everything before January 20th, um, all of the statistical memorandums, everything from the Office of Management and Budget is in the Obama White House archives. So these are, these are archived, but they are still U.S. government policy um, unless they've been changed, um, even though that's where they're stored. Um, ICPSR at the time or shortly after the um, memo posted its interpretation um, and advice to the research community on the implementation of the OSTP memo um, um, with guidelines for researchers on how to manage their data and how to share their data, and that's there. Um, we have the Commission on Evidence-Based Policy, um, which is something which I don't know how many people know about this. This is something which was released about a month ago. I talked about it a little bit yesterday at lunch. This is a very important report recommending um, improvements in how the federal government and state and federal agencies um, share data um, and use data for program evaluation and of evidence-based policy making. And then finally, um, I think uh, Joanna will talk more about the researcher credentialing project and a link to that um, talks about the things that we're doing to try to make um, restricted data more accessible. So um, as, as we said in, um, in there, is this, am I supposed to, no, no, this is still me, right? Okay. Not this slide? Oh, see, okay, this is, I'm looking at this and thinking, did you want me to, because this isn't what, okay. So I am going to talk, see, this is why I have staff there. I'm going to talk about these things, right? Um, and I want to say just a couple things about um, both the OSTP memo and the uh, Commission on Evidence-Based Policy. So the first thing is the OSTP memo was an incredible step forward in terms of um, requiring, essentially, um, uh, federal, uh, data collected with federal funds to be shared with the general public to require that um, research that's done with federal funds to be shared with the general public to limit the ability of um, information to be stifled or hidden from the public um, and that's, uh, that increases the transparency of government, increases the scientific value of research by adding transparency to the process and it increases the investment, the return on the investment that the government makes in research and particularly in data creation um, uh, for, the, for the research community. One thing which I've been thinking about a lot and which I kind of 
you know, been talking to Justin, who will be talking to, and to Trent and to others, including people in the federal government about a lot, is that there is this, there has been this enormous and incredibly important emphasis on making data open and uh, um, as a result of the OSTP memo. And we absolutely support accessibility to data. One of the things that I was struck by, however, in the report, um, and I, I should have brought the phrasing up here, um, is that it says that data, it talks about publications and that they should be shared and that they shouldn't be embargoed for more than a year and that we also recognize that publishers need to be viable. And then it talks about data and it says and data should be made available without charge and I thought and we know that sharing publications has costs and maintaining them has costs but we don't think so about data and then I kept reading because not surprisingly, these people, the people writing the OSTP memo did not just tweet 20 words. They actually had a long and thoughtful process. And so they said this should be shared without cost while balancing the needs for preservation, documentation, metadata, discoverability. And I actually thought, of course, and that is exactly what the membership of ICPSR has been supporting all along, which is sharing data and making it accessible without, at, at no cost to the millions of researchers and students who are part of your member institutions, and doing that in a way that makes it possible, that it makes it possible to balance the needs for preservation and documentation and discoverability and usability. Um, and, and actually I thought we've all, I think, I think we have all, at least at ICPSR, and I think most of the community has focused on the we need to, you know, share your data. You can't just you can't just let the data die. It can't just be in some, you know, somebody can't just hoard it and refuse to give it if they have federal funds that has to be available. But I think we also need to, I think we also know that part of the response to this has been to make data available in ways that are not sustainable, that are not actually reusable, and therefore don't actually leverage that federal investment for more scientific research. And I am, I was, and I'm really proud to say that this organization has actually been striking that balance for 50 years, making data available in a way that preserves it and makes it reusable. So that's kind of a, 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 a my thoughts about the OSTP memo and what we think about it um, after after four years. The last thing I'm just going to take one minute because otherwise the music really will start, um, um, about the Commission on Evidence-Based Policy, because I don't know if people are as, as aware of the Commission and its recent report, but this is a very important report that is about, it's not about data in general, and it's not, it's not about data financed by the federal government you know, through the research endeavors of the National Science Foundation and National Institutes of Health. It's about the data that the government produces, both, it addresses addresses both the federal government and state government agencies that they produce both as part of statistical agencies but also as part of doing the work of government. So program data on, on food stamps and unemployment and, um, data um, and data on employment and unemployment, data on job training, data on schools um, is actually addressed very specifically trying to figure and, and the question is how do we make all of this digital trace activity of the of, of the activity of humans and their interactions with the government agencies and with federally funded programs how do we make that available and accessible to the research community in a way that improves the evidence base that we use to, to implement, to, to design and implement policies. That we want to be able to use that data to design and implement policies better, both on the part of government um, program designers and policymakers, and on the part of the research community. And 
as is always the case, these commissions, um, uh, these kinds of reports are trying to strike a balance between accessibility um, and preservation of the privacy of, um, of individuals when they do interact with the government. Um, and the, the commission recommends both legislative changes that will make it possible to use, say, um, FERPA protected data for evidence-based policy evaluation in a way that is much harder to do now, so education data. Um, it also recommends making the data that every single state collects about employment and earnings of individuals um, uh, as part of their federally supported unemployment insurance um, programs, that those data should be available to the research community. Last night when we introduced um, Julia Lane for her um, uh, for her prize, the Miller Award, um, Jason mentioned the LEHD program, and I don't know how many of you know the LEHD program is the Longitudinal Employer um, Household Dynamics Program. It is actually constructed from the unemployment insurance records of the 50 states and Puerto Rico, because it is part of the United States of America, and, uh, and Washington, D.C., and other um, other territories. It is, um, that data is incredibly rich and it gives an incredibly rich picture of the employment and earnings opportunities and transitions, the growth and, and decline of firms and industries um, in the United States. And it's actually incredibly hard to get a hold of because it has 53 at least different data custodians. And if for those of you who have never tried to get data that has 53 different data custodians, all of whom have in principle legal veto power, it requires a lot of, um, well, as I say, patience and a sense of humor. Um, so th um, this, this, uh, the recommendations of the report are to um, to liberate data like this, not liberate them so that anybody can look to see what you earned last month, but liberate them so that they are protected um, through a national data service, um, and but available for the research community. One of the things I think, so the recommendation, the primary, the, mo the single most important recommendation of the commission's report is the establishment of a national secure data service that will protect and make accessible um, this kind of administrative data for research and evidence-based policy um, making. Um, one of the things I would really like to emphasize in thinking about ICPSR's role in this is that we've actually seen that this, uh, and this commission report is in some sense a reflection of the efforts of people in different program areas, different topical areas, um, and different regions of the country to try to build this kind of data infrastructure. So there are education, uh, there are state education data archives. There's actually one being built in Michigan that's being joint, that's joint between the University of Michigan and Michigan State University. People say that we don't acknowledge Michigan State, but we are collaborating with them in this and with the state of Michigan to create a K through 12 um, state of Michigan on data infrastructure. There are similar kinds of efforts to improve education data infrastructure around the world, around the country. Um, I'm sure there are around the world as well. There's other kinds of efforts in terms of employment. Oh, she, she, she's good. Um, uh, but so what I would say is what's really important, we'll talk some about ICPSR's role in this when we talk about researcher credentialing, but the other thing I think is that we need to have this data be able to be interoperable, and that requires having good, consistent metadata, and that is exactly what ICPSR and those of us outside the federal statistical community have been working on for years. So both providing that expertise, that guidance to those, and also making sure that a lot of that data is actually um, archived and preserved and documented um, outside the federal um, government and provides it, makes it safer and more accessible, and it can still be useful um, if we have the uh, interoperable metadata and interoperable technology that allows us to, um, to bring those data together um, when necessary for research questions and not for other inappropriate purposes. On that note, I am turning things over to Jared. And she did not even start playing the music. Um, but maybe that's I gave you five minutes of my time, oh, yeah. so. <laughs> um, 
So I'm gonna take a, a deeper dive into uh, the OSTV memo and uh, talk about uh, you, you know, what that memo was, uh, some of the response that's come from the federal agencies, and then uh, also how it relates to uh, us and you, uh, uh, all of us in the community, and what parts we can do to uh, encourage uh, better data sharing and data uh, preservation. Uh, of course, this, uh, the OSTP memo came out in 2013, but the, uh, the federal agencies had been uh, taking steps before then in 2003 for NIH with uh, these data sharing plans uh, that were required for grants over a certain amount of money. Uh, NSF in 2011 required, started requiring it for uh, all of their uh, proposals that were submitted. Uh, but in 2013, there was really a, 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 this a push coming out of the White House Office of Science Technology Policy uh, in this memo called Increasing Access to the Results of Federally Funded Scientific Research. And really a lot of buzz at the time, and still is. Uh, the, it had 13 elements uh, that were part of the OSP, OSTP memo. Uh, we summarized them, they're on our website if you wanna see. But I like to boil them down into five points. Uh, one, that the memo covered maximizing access to the data. Uh, second, while maximizing access, you're protecting confidentiality and privacy, that you're providing appropriate attribution to the data, that you're ensuring long-term preservation sustainability, and that you're building in this data management planning into the entire process, especially at the beginning. Um, of course, after the, the memo was released, uh, many of you may remember there was an opportunity for public comment while the federal agencies were uh, preparing responses. We participated in some of this public comment, as I know uh, some of you in the community did. Uh, we posted those comments out there. And then we waited for the federal agencies to respond. And I, I really want to uh, commend the, especially the library community uh, who took a, a keen eye and followed and tracked these responses uh, really in real time. This was from Oregon State. They put up a, a page uh, that was tracking it as the the responses came out. Uh, this was uh, actually, I think it started as a Google Doc and then they posted it to Figshare, uh, again, compiling the responses. So what's happened now or what's happened since? This was uh, the cabinet exit memo at the end of the Obama administration. Uh, OSTP uh, chief staff uh, prepared this and said and reported that more than 20 federal agencies responsible for more than 99% of federal R&D have completed and are implementing their public access plans. So that's a, that's a really great positive uh, result. SENDI, uh, uh, which is an organization that works with government agencies, uh, has been tracking and compiling where these memos are, as has Spark. And actually Spark has a great website if you wanna check it out where you can look, actually compare memos, uh, compare responses, and they've uh, boiled those responses down into both current implementations, so what the agencies say they're doing now, as well as uh, interpreting uh, what the agencies are saying they're gonna do in the future. Um, so some more positive things that came out of this. Uh, in addition to the agencies required to provide plans responding to the OSTP directive, so the memo was really directed at agencies providing uh, with annual research budgets, budgets over $100 million. Uh, several smaller agencies have responded as well. So this has spurred uh, many, many in the, in the federal government to think about these issues of data uh, management, data access, and data preservation. Uh, as well, they've had a number of interagency uh, coordination uh, meetings hosted by the OSTP uh, since the directive was uh, published. I, I know there have been other meetings that have been spurred by this uh, and other organizations uh, that have come into play, the Research Data Alliance and, and others. So I want to take drill down into some examples of some federal agencies of what they're, they're doing. These are agencies that uh, we interact with directly uh, within the government. Uh, this comes out of the National Science Foundation and talk about how they're Many of them are implementing them in these plans incrementally, so step by step, uh, and how they plan to implement them immediately as well as into the future. So NSF and their response, which is here, 
anyone can access. They say NSF proposes to implement its public access plan incrementally and expects to manage data and publications in a co coherent, integrated framework that can accommodate products of both, right, the memo discussed publications as well as the data. So taking the data management plan portion of uh, the NSF response, uh, we can look at how they're implementing things immediately and really it's taking their existing plan, right? So they've had this uh, data and associated outcomes that result from NSF funded research and are subject to the existing data management plan requirement implemented in 2011. So they're, they're continuing on with what they've been doing, this good, good practice for a number of years. But they, what they expect to do in the future, and this is what we can look forward to, is a couple things. One, uh, they want to provide guidance for reviewers and program officers to enable greater consistency in the review of data management plans while remaining sensitive to disciplinary considerations and practice. So some of the uh, critiques of uh, requiring or asking people to provide data management plans is that while you, people are creating these plans, there's uh, not necessarily a consistency of how they're applied or how they're reviewed and how that applies to uh, the scoring, uh, if at all uh, applies to the scoring of these proposals. So they're, they're hoping to provide better uh, consistency in the review. Another aspect that the NFS, NSF expects to do is develop uh, revisions to NSF's online proposal submission to enable template-driven responses. Um, and that will allow them to, to, uh, to track automated uh, compliance with these data management plans. So I think that, that responds to some, some other uh, questions people have is even though people are submitting uh, with their proposals data management plans, how are uh, how is compliance with those plans tracked? And it looks like the NSF is actually planning to do that in the future. Um, as another example, coming out of the National Institutes of Health, uh, their plan discusses attribution. And again, they're taking an incremental approach. Uh, and currently, uh, they, they discuss how that there's no NIH-wide system for providing consistent identification and attribution for NIH-funded data. Um, and then they talk about moving forward, they aim to ensure that data generated by uh, their funded research can be cited and attribution can be provided. Uh, and they talk about as part of the data discovery index, a system for unique identifiers for data sets generated by NIH funded research will be developed analogous to the PubMed central identification number. So I'm not quite sure how that'll be implemented, but they're, they're looking at these uh, new ways of ensuring that data are, are fully at, at, attributed and that there'll be a system in place for doing so. So some neat things, I think, coming down the road. Uh, and uh, what I want to do is emphasize while the federal agencies are taking uh, incremental steps, uh, we as a community can continue to advocate for these best practices that we've advocated for uh, decades, right? So just touching on what those are, I think you've all of you have heard these before, but maximizing access. So what does that really mean? Both that we're ensuring that the data are discoverable so that you can find them uh, in a catalog somewhere, that they're not just some random card in your desk. Um, and that if you find them, that they're accessible, that you're able to interpret them. If you don't say, oh, what does purple mean in that coding scheme? Uh, you know exactly what the codes are and you can make use of the data. Um, we like to say that um, if it's accessible, that it's curated, and that means that it's complete and self-explanatory. I like to think of it as almost like giving your data a, a good cleaning. So what we do is we, we clean up the data, we provide it in multiple formats, we provide it in well-described uh, metadata, uh, we use DDI. And then, of course, when it's clean, people can easily find it, like this collection here, the 500 Family Study, where it has uh, good metadata, uh, very complete metadata uh, that people can access. And we provide the metadata in uh, different ways. This is just showing a, a collaboration we have with uh, search engines where they can more easily pull in our metadata uh, into their results. So uh, the next thing is protecting confidentiality and privacy, and I think Joanna's gonna uh, touch on this a little bit, but we know that it's important to, uh, to check for these issues and ensure that the data uh, are made accessible while uh, uh, ensuring that certain safeguards are in place. 
Um, so we like to talk about safe data, safe places, and safe people. So safe data, taking steps to, uh, to make sure that uh, indirect and direct identifiers are either uh, suppressed or uh, removed as needed, uh, but that there are safe places to, to make these data available in uh, if you can't take certain actions on the data. And then safe people, making sure that people are trained in these issues. Uh, Joanna is going to talk about a project we have here with that Maggie uh, is leading on researcher credentialing, so establishing community recognized systems of researcher uh, qualities, uh, again, uh, in place to ensure that confidential and private uh, data can be made available more easily. Uh, the third is providing appropriate attribution, so properly citing the data. Uh, so for instance, a citation like this. Uh, so that people can again find and then cite those data so that people can know how the data are being used. Uh, this just shows how once we uh, provide a citation, we can go out and find those related publications and then provide uh, links to those publications on our website. And then once those publications are linked, if they go to an article, they can then see where the data come from, right? Pretty obvious stuff, but um, uh, still kind of in the early days for implementation. Long-term preservation and sustainability. Um, there's this fun quote, it says digital information lasts forever or five years, whichever comes first. Uh, in some ways, these old cuneiform tablets uh, are eas more easily preserved than uh, digital data and that you can just tuck them away and forget about them for hundreds of years, uh, whereas these diskettes, you have to take more care. But uh, we, we've dealt with punch cards and old formats but there are certainly easy steps you can take to make sure that the data are accessible uh, over the long term. And archives and libraries are certainly willing to, to work with people on that. And once you do that, then they're, they're available for, uh, you know, for future researchers. Uh, as well, uh, there are assessments and um, uh, audits in place to help ensure that uh, repositories are taking the necessary steps to preserve and uh, uh, archive collections over the long term. These are just a few of uh, the assessments that we've undertaken at ICPSR, uh, including the data seal of approval, the World Data System uh, certification. And then finally, data management planning. We, we feel that that's a really important thing for researchers to do. Uh, it's uh, required more and more by funding agencies, so we've put out uh, resources. I know many of you have resources yourselves. Uh, just as a reminder, they're available to, to download, as well as we have guidance uh, online, and then we provide training and workshops and these things. Um, I think the other thing that in the agenda was for me to talk about the census uh, portal, is that right? Um, do you want me to do that now? Okay, great. So, uh, so we talked about the federal agencies responding to uh, the OSTP memo and uh, trying to provide better uh, increased access to their collections. Uh, we've been working with the Census Bureau to create a portal uh, which would allow uh, for them to upload uh, metadata as well as they could upload data in the future. Uh, but for the initial uh, release, we'll be working on uh, making accessible their, their instruments, survey instruments, and other metadata associated with collections. Uh, this will be a really great thing for them to make their uh, collections more accessible, discoverable, both internally as well as externally to people so that they can, they can find and, and access this information. We're looking to launch in the next couple of months, and so we'll certainly announce that and provide more information uh, then. So uh, I think I'll turn it over to Joanna. So I am going to talk a little bit more um, about this commission report on evidence-based policymaking uh, that Maggie talked about a little bit before um, and how it relates to what we're doing at ICPSR, what we have been doing, and then upcoming projects as well. Um, I'll summarize here the recommendations from two of the four major parts of the report, um, the parts that I think are most relevant to ICPSR's users and to this presentation today. So the first set of recommendations uh, are for improving secure, private, and confidential data access. Uh, there are in total six recommendations, most of which are, are very relevant to our community, very relevant to, to ICPSR. 
so first, the committee recommends the establishment of, as Maggie said, the na a national secure data service. Uh, so this would be a state-of-the-art resource for improving the government's capacity to use data that it, it already collects, right? So it's not an additional burden for data collection, but a, uh, a, way, to, a way to pull it all together and offer it for uh, access in one place. Um, additionally, uh, and I think this part is, is particularly interesting and innovative, um, this national data service would allow folks to temporarily link um, existing data sets that are currently warehoused separately and, and accessed separately. Uh, this, I think, would present uh, many exciting research opportunities uh, that are now probably pretty frustrating um, and difficult or even impossible to, 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 to pursue. Due to, due to the locations of the data um, and lack of infrastructure to support the secure and responsible use of these different data sets together. The second recommendation uh, is to require stringent privacy qualifications for acquiring uh, and combining data. So folks who are seeking to access data will need to demonstrate a certain set of skills, a certain level of experience uh, and knowledge in order for the government to uh, regard them as trusted data users. The third recommendation is to review, as Maggie said, standing laws and legislation uh, with an eye towards easing the restrictions on data sharing in line with the, the, this national data, national secure data service and recommendations in the report. Um, there are certainly laws in place uh, that encumber or prohibit use of data for statistical purposes, uh, and the commission recommends that these be reviewed and revised if necessary. The fourth and fifth recommendations uh, highlight the need for access to, uh, as Maggie mentioned, state collected data for evidence building. The sixth recommendation um, in this first section is in red here because it is super relevant to what ICPSR is doing right now to ease the process of gaining access to, to restricted data uh, without compromising our responsibility to uh, the protection of confidentiality of research um, subjects or uh, you know, f folks or organizations within the administrative data, um, and instead hopefully strengthening our capabilities in this area. So the recommendation is to develop a uniform process for external researchers to apply and qualify for secure access to confidential government data. Um, I know that right now the process for applying for government data can be different from department to department within the government. Uh, and even between offices within the same department, uh, on a smaller scale, we deal with uh, this issue of divergent access processes and requirements every day, the ICPSR, uh, due to different funder requirements, project requirements, um, or our assessed needs based on based on the data set that we receive. That we receive. Um, we are working at ICPSR to streamline restricted data uh, application processes, which is exciting. Um, we're, we're streamlining the processes, the access requirements, and dissemination methods. I'll talk a little bit more uh, about this in a couple of slides, uh, but um, so uh, including a little preview of our researcher credentialing project uh, that's really timely and relevant uh, with regard to this last recommendation here. So I'll go back to that in a minute. Okay, so the second set of recommendations from the Commission are for modernizing privacy protections for evidence building. Uh, here, th there are a total four recommendations, again, most of which are very relevant to ICPSR's work and to our community. Uh, the committee first recommends comprehensive risk assessments on all de-identified confidential data that are intended uh, for public release. Our curators at ICPSR do this every day, uh, and it's a, a challenging but also happily uh, challenging but interesting work. The second re recommendation is to adopt modern privacy enhancing technologies for confidential data. Third and fourth recommendations relate to leadership and policies intended to improve the public's trust in government data collection and protection, always a good thing, along with trust in the accuracy of the information shaping our government's decision making. Um, there are two other sets of recommendations in the report, uh, one regarding the implementation details for this national secure data service. Uh, and one regarding the strengthening of federal uh, evidence building capacity. The link included at the beginning of this presentation will take you right to the report and the executive summary, uh, and you can read more about those other elements there. So these recommendations from the commission um, do not directly affect us uh, in that they are recommendations for government data held by the government uh, versus deposited with ICPSR or other repositories. 
but they are, I think, a really exciting advancement toward the development of a shared understanding of what confidentiality means, what data security means, and the notion of good data stewardship. So in that vein, I'm going to briefly discuss the work we're doing here at ICPSR right now to improve access to uh, the restricted data that we disseminate, but also uh, beyond just our holdings. So first, I will tell you about this researcher credentialing project that, that uh, Maggie mentioned and that I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, so in January of this year, we began work on an Alfred P. Sloan Foundation funded project to research, develop, and pilot a system of researcher credentials. So what this, what this means in a nutshell is the researchers can have associated with a, um, with a unique and durable identifier, they can have a credential that will indicate to data repositories like ICPSR and others what sort of level of restricted data the credentialing body has approved them for. So you can imagine a system of um, bronze, silver, and gold perhaps associated with different uh, levels of data security training, different levels of education, different uh, pre-existing clearances, for instance, special sworn status at the Census Bureau. These components would be considered together uh, and lead to the determination of a credential level for an individual researcher. The researcher can then take this credential to other institutions, so the idea is that it will be portable. Uh, uh, other institutions who are part of this community and then can easily demonstrate their, their trustworthiness. The hope is that this will reduce the burden on both the researcher and organizations that are interested in uh, protecting their data by vetting their users. I know that this is a this process is is um, is, is cumbersome at ICPSR and then takes a lot of staff time. And so this this project, among others, will hopefully streamline these processes and make them more a little bit more rational and reduce you know staff effort needed to to keep them going. Uh, if we can establish uh, and share community norm standards. Uh, for responsible data use, then we can streamline these processes quite a bit, hopefully. A little plug for the next presentation that's going to be in this room. Um, navigating restricted use data today and in the future. If you stick around for that, uh, you'll actually learn a lot more about the credentialing project uh, directly from the doctoral student who is conducting the underlying research right now with us at ICPSR. Uh, I'll, I'll go over quickly just a few other things that ICPSR is doing right now to, uh, to streamline and standardize the, the processes uh, for restricted data access. So the first is standardizing our data use agreements. Um, <clears throat> we have uh, within ICPSR several projects, obviously many, many data sets uh, and different, different funding, different funders. And um, for, for logical reasons, there are data use agreements uh, across the building that have evolved uh, sort of naturally, organically over the years, but that means that we have many different data use agreements um, that are not substantially different from one another, but they require sort of special snowflake processing each time. Um, and so what we've been doing for a few months now is evaluating all of these data use agreements and understanding what what is absolutely necessary to go into these legal documents and what is not so that we can have a, a single template for, for access to restricted data. Um, and that's going to be a, a huge improvement in, in staff burden, but also a huge improvement in sort of the, the logic of accessing data and the, the ease of, of um, uh, accessing multiple data sets by one researcher through one institution. Uh, also reimagined and redesigned restricted data application portal and procedures. Uh, we are right now working, I'm sure you've heard about the ARCINEX process at ICPSR. Uh, we are just beginning to, to map out what a new restricted data application process is going to look like. We have a few different systems right now um, that, that your folks have to, have to go through to, um, to apply for access to our restricted data. Um, again, sort of grown organically over the years. And we are, um, uh, building a system to integrate all of these and make them more rational and logical. Um, again, hoping to, to reduce burden on us and reduce burden on the, on the applicants. Uh, and then rationalized data security plans. This is, this is something I'm particularly excited about. Um, <laughs> we have um, three or four commonly used data security plans that go along with these data use agreements for access to restricted data, um, but they, uh, they are cumbersome in that they require very detailed information from the user, sort of negotiated with ICPSR, uh, and they they raise a lot of questions and 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 um, sort of uh, 
ask for a lot of staff time on our part uh, and a lot of a lot of time on the part of the, the applicant as well. Um, so we are, we are streamlining these, making them a lot simpler, but still accomplishing the same goals of letting folks know what, what uh, computing configurations are safe for, for the data that they're accessing. And I think that's it for me. And now it's Justin. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to be talking now about different federal data sharing projects and government data sharing initiatives that are ongoing at ICPSR. So of course, ICPSR does have this 50 plus year track record in this long commitment to safekeeping and disseminating both US government data and other social science data. And historically, the way that ICPSR has acquired and processed government data collections are either one, with support from the ICPSR membership, or also partnering with uh, various sponsored projects in federal agencies to make particular data collections freely available to the public. Uh, in fact, we have a, in our collection development policy a, a section on government data, and here's just a couple of things that I wanna highlight about that. Basically, it says that ICPSR will acquire government data when we believe that we can add significant value to users and to you know, the ICPSR community by ingesting that data and curating and enhancing it, or when we can ensure long-term preservation of the data and then also add value to the data collection through curation uh, in order to increase, the, again, the accessibility and the discoverability and correct use of, of data. Um, Another component that I wanted to point out of the collection development policy pertaining to government data is this statement that you know we will accept requests from users, from the community, from ORs, uh, and members uh, of our uh, of our our users uh, about government data that are difficult to find or at risk, difficult to to locate or use, or just have high interests. Um, you know, by our, our community, and if that's the case, then we will go out and, and acquire those as a benefit to the ICPSR membership. Uh, there are really three types of funded projects at, at ICPSR with respect to government data. So ICPSR ha has partnered with federal agencies to curate, you know, single high value data sets for a particular agency or organization. We also do things such as training or create infrastructure to improve the dissemination of government data. And then also what a lot of you are probably familiar with are these topical archives or thematic collections that are hosted within ICPSR. We partner with these federal agencies to curate and disseminate data um, pertaining to that particular agency or particular topical area. And here are a few examples that I just wanted to, to highlight. One is the National Archive of Criminal Justice Data, a longstanding project at ICPSR uh, that is funded by three Department of Justice agencies. And then also here's an example of, of a newer project, the National Archive of Data on Arts and Culture, which is sponsored by the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, there are a handful of other government-sponsored thematic collections at, at ICPSR. Uh, here's a, a few more that I just wanted to briefly highlight, the uh, archive pertaining to aging, uh, demography, uh, national addiction and HIV data archive program, and, and then also the, the child care and early uh, education research connections archive. And those uh, archives uh, are, are funded by various government uh, sponsors here, uh, and this is a, a list of uh, current government sponsors as well as past government sponsors in which we ha have uh, built relationships with either for a, a particular thematic collection, a topical archive, or on these uh, projects to archive particular data sets or, or build infrastructure. Now I want to uh, transition and talk a little bit more about other things that ICPSR is doing with respect to government data. Uh, and so there, there are other three real mechanisms uh, besides these funded archives to share and disseminate government data at, at ICPSR. There's the ICPSR membership, open ICPSR, and also the Data Lumos repository. 
So with respect to the ICPSR membership, we have a large catalog of government data that is archived in ICPSR's holdings that have been enhanced by ICPSR curators as a benefit for the ICPSR membership. So we have uh, census data, we have voting records, we have other serial collections, including the, the na uh, data from the National Center on Educational uh, education statistics. And so these government data collections are things that ICPSR staff have evaluated uh, ourselves and determined that they're high use data sets, you know, high value collections, and uh, we often ingest them so that we can, again, increase the, the usability and accessibility of, of these data collections. So uh, one example might be that a government agency only distributes the data in a particular format. Uh, and so then, as part of the curation process, we can make it easier for users to access the data by taking that one format and instead uh, disseminating it in, in multiple formats, also you know, ensuring the long-term preservation by putting it into ASCII format and putting it in our you know, variable level discovery tool. And so again, just trying to increase the accessibility and usability of those da data collections in a manner that is consistent with all the other curated products that are distributed by ICPSR. Uh, the Open ICPSR repository is a, another option for archiving data. So this uh, is a self-deposit archiving option at, at ICPSR. And uh, the advantage of depositing in Open ICPSR is that the data are freely available to the, the general public and uh, they are not just restricted to the ICPSR membership, but with the caveat that ICPSR staff are not reviewing or enhancing these uh, self-deposited files. So it, it's up to the depositor to ensure the accessibility and discoverability and usability of those data collections. But the, you know, the reason I bring this up is because researchers are increasingly using open ICPSR because it enables them to meet the open access and data sharing re requirements associated with particular projects. And so we're seeing an increasing number of government funded data collections being submitted into open ICPSR. Uh, there are you know, definitely dozens of collections that are NSF and NIH funded that have been submitted into open ICPSR. And so that's something that we're uh, cognizant of and are you know, thinking through ways to, uh, you know, what should we do in terms of increasing the usability of those data collections and do we need to do additional curation on select projects that are submitted into open ICPSR. The third data archiving option uh, that I wanted to talk about is the Data Lumos repository. So this repository was initiated by staff concern at, at ICPSR and this, you know, long-standing passion to steward at-risk government data. So there were many data rescue movements going on, and this is ICPSR's take on uh, doing something very publicly facing to demonstrate our commitment to being a steward for at-risk data. So Data Lumos is this open data re repository at, at ICPSR that's designed for at-risk government data. So any data that a user or a member, uh, a, someone in the ICPSR membership feels that it is at risk or there's some concern about its long-term availability or discoverability is welcome to archive it in the Data Lumos repository to ensure its long-term preservation and accessibility. So there are, are two ways of doing that. One, if a researcher is, is comfortable enough with uh, taking that at-risk data resource and depositing it him or herself, you can go directly to the Data Lumos repository and you know, do a self-deposit. It's very similar to open ICPSR, and it will be included in both the Data Lumos repository and then it will also be included in the ICPSR main search results. Uh, the other option that we have through the Data Lumos website is a recommendation form. So uh, we are soliciting recommendations of at-risk data collections if an individual is not comfortable enough with uh, obtaining a data resource and submitting it themselves, or they're aware of something but don't know where it is, they can submit it, uh, this information about the data collection through the recommendation form, and then ICPSR staff will go out and investigate that, that data collection and add it to the Data Lumos repository. Uh, 
the Data Lumos repository picked up quite a bit of press. We did a handful of webinars. We presented it at a variety of conferences. There were some social media events such as Love Your Data Week and Endanger Data Week. And so it really did get us a, a lot of publicity. And we have to date received a little over, I think it was 44 data submissions into Data Lumos. Uh, it was launched in February of this year. And then also we've received dozens of recommendations through the recommendation form or through individuals and outreach that ICPS, our staff and leadership have been doing. And so because of all this publicity, we were actually uh, approached by the Annie E. Casey Foundation. They were really interested in our initiative and what we were doing to preserve at-risk data. Um, and so uh, after having you know, some emails back and forth uh, and uh, calls and submitting a concept paper, uh, they did uh, award us this award that basically uh, continues to develop the Data Lumos repository. So the Casey Foundation heavily relies on federal government data to do their work. And so what they wanted us to do is reach out to all of their constituents and grantees and understand more from, especially from the Annie E. Casey Foundation perspective, are there data resources out there that are at risk? And if so, you know, we want to go out and understand more about the you know, perceptions of these at-risk data resources and then submit them and permanently archive them in the Data Lumos repository. So this project, again, is really focusing on identifying, monitoring, and archiving these data resources. Uh, and it is a lot of outreach and engagement between ICPSR and these other data communities, specifically uh, Annie E. Casey Foundation uh, awardees and partners, but other data communities who just have knowledge and insights about data that may be at risk of being made inaccessible to the public in the future. So um, again, this, this slide just highlights some of the outreach activities that we plan to do. So we, we want to reach out to data users, uh, also data producers and data advocates, uh, data advocacy organizations, data intermediaries, uh, but then also you know, civil servants and other uh, former government uh, employees who have a background in working with, with data at, at the federal government later, at the, excuse me, at the federal government level. Um, and so the, the performance measures also are really, to, again, to drive traffic to Data Lumos, to increase re recommendations of, of address data collections, uh, increase deposits to the Data Lumos website, uh, and along with that, you know, increasing web traffic and, and downloads and just demonstrating the, the importance of this repository. One other component of the project that I wanted to mention now is that the ICPSR acquisitions team had already planned on administering a survey to uh, the ICPSR membership and to the ORs to uh, gain an understanding of data collections that should be added to ICPSR. So are there particular studies, particular uh, topical areas of, of interest, or other types of holdings you know, that we should be actively seeking out to add to our collection. And so uh, it was great that we already had intended on, on doing that as part of our regular acquisitions activities, but it, it really um, goes nicely with the Annie E. Casey Foundation project because as part of this survey now, we can also ask questions about perceptions of at-risk data resources, ask questions about government data, and again, just really be in touch with the OR community and the ICPSR users to better understand the, the data needs uh, from, our, from, our, from our community, along with other data management and data sharing problems that, that the community and, and our membership is seeing. So the, the kind of the call of action here with respect to, to Data Lumos is encouraging all of you to either uh, contact us with recommendations or actually do deposits on the Data Lumos website. And then also, please feel free to reach out to us uh, if you have re referrals of particular organizations or individuals. If, you know, we know there are a lot of data rescue and data refuge movements that are also going on out there. So if you have ideas where we can you know avoid duplications of effort that would be great you know but we're being in contact with people who have already you know saved a lot of data resources and maybe are storing them locally 
on a particular network, but they just haven't decided a permanent home for those data resources yet. So that, you know, that, that would be great if you are aware of situations uh, like that. And so uh, at this time, I think we would like to open it up for questions for uh, you know, any, any of the panelists and presenters here. I know Alina in the back has a microphone, so if you do have questions, uh, please, uh, we'll, we'll get the microphone to you so that the people on the, the webinar and the live stream uh, will be able to hear those questions as well. Um, one is just a, um, a recommendation, which is an easy one. Um, for the ORs, we get a list each week of the new items that have been added to ICPSR, but that does not include those items in Data Lumos. So I go in every week and search, uh, but given that these are getting treatment, it would be really nice if those could be included as part of the list. So right now there's new, there's updated, and maybe have a Data Lumos section. Uh, my other um, goes back to uh, one of the comments that Joanna made, and that is, um, and I've said this at many meetings here in ISIS, but as everybody knows, I persist until I get my way. <laughs> and um, so regarding state data and restricted, so often people do not need the restricted microdata. What they need are just simple tabs by state, so not where you can get every single thing. And I was quite inspired last night uh, by um, the talk about IPOMs and how they were able to get censuses from around the world to give their data by not giving everything out. And I know with restricted data that's not the case and you can't go quite nearly that far, but on the other hand, for at least simple tabs, for a lot of things, you have a system in place that you have used for a few things, RDAS, and that would be really useful, particularly for a lot of the crime data, and obviously taking into account cell sizes and, and all the types of things that you would do, uh, but that would actually protect the data better while enabling people to often get the items that they need. And I know it's not quite as easy as I'm making it out because that involves a lot of work and a lot of disclosure looks and so forth, but I think in the long run it would help uh, free up the data to a lot of people that need a finer geography, uh, but with the drawback that they wouldn't have quite as many uh, cross tabs and so forth. Can I, can I just say one thing in response to uh, yeah. um, so I I think that's a, a great idea and emphasizing that it's really important to be able to use kind of remote job submission software or encrypt or encryption software depending on what people need um, to allow people to access restricted data without seeing individual microdata is really I think is exactly right um, for I mean for some researchers access to the microdata is really important especially when you're talking about analyzing administrative and program data oftentimes people don't quite know what's in there and if you don't see the microdata you do stupid things so I so on the other hand for data that is you know reasonably cleaned up you're absolutely right most people don't need to have access to the microdata one thing we are doing we are working on as part of the development of Arcanex is what Trent is now calling a rapid tabulator tool. We have, we've had a couple different names for this. This rapid tabulator um, tool will be, um, will be there. And we haven't thought, of, we haven't talked about it, at least I haven't talked about it as much in terms of accessing restricted data as a, um, uh, as a, a substitute for secure SDA or something like that. But I think that that is definitely when we shift next winter toward talking about how the different modes in which we are going to um, allow access to restricted data and how to in, uh, integrate and streamline that process, that will also be on the table. So thank you for that feedback. Um, there was, Alina, there was My question is about how how does proprietary data or data sets that people purchase fit into this conversation? Yeah. So for example, 
Um, I work at the Pew Charitable Trust, and a lot of my project teams purchase especially health data or transactional data. Yep. Um, and I'm just curious, like from a philosophical standpoint, how it fits into this whole conversation. So, so that's actually, that's a great question. Um, ICPSR right now does not have a lot of commercial proprietary data. We actually have been talking to a couple companies, um, and Justin's been in those conversations, and Jared is um, going to be talking to a company, I think, in the next couple days about some other commercial data. I think philosophically what I would say is it's extremely important that organizations like ICPSR get involved in this process because researchers are signing these one-off agreements to buy data, which then cannot, you know, buy agreement cannot be made available to anyone else, and it undermines the transparency and the scientificity, if you like, the rigorousness of the research. It undermines everything, not just that it's not fair that someone else can get access to it, but we actually can't build on each other's knowledge. There's no reproducibility. There's no replicability. So ICPSR is part in addressing this, I think, has an important role to play in assuring that commercial data sets that are used for research purposes are available appropriately to um, of, to the broader research community. To that end, we have been talking directly to a number of companies which have repeatedly come to these kinds of agreements with individual researchers to say, look, if you give us a data set or a data set on a regular basis, we can establish, a, again, a template NDA that we will make available to the research community that protects your data. In this case, it may not be protecting the confidentiality, the privacy of an individual, but rather the proprietary nature of the data, um, but does it in a way that still provides relatively uniform access to the research community, protects the proprietary data, and um, and actually relieves the company of the burden of having to negotiate individual agreements. Most of these companies, their business model is not selling data to academics, right? That's something which they, you know, they, they figure out each time it's a pain, it's a little bit of money because they don't want to give it away for free. But what we've been saying is, okay, most, many of these companies, the data, once it's six months or a year old, given the way that things work today, that data has very little commercial value when it's, you know, whether it's, whether it's yesterday's data or two years ago's data, but giving, giving us that, those older data in a way that um, we can um, version the data, it can be, uh, it can be accessed by the research community under these same kinds of conditions is actually, is, is something which we're working on with a number of different companies. And then I think we want to be able to use our experiences to provide an example to the research community of how this can be done. Because, um, I know I'm actually on the the search committee for the American Economics Association, which has a data sharing requirement for its publications, and they now are up to about at least a third of their publications that are empirical studies get waivers um, of, of data sharing, and it's almost all not because it's restricted government data. Almost all of it is because researchers are using commercial data. Um, and therefore saying, oh, I can't meet your data sharing requirements. Up, oh, just give me a waiver. So we're working, the AEA is working to figure out a different response to this. What can you actually share under the commission, c conditions of your NDA? But we also need a longer term solution, which is what are the NDAs that are reasonable for researchers to participate in for, th for that to be considered, you know, actually academic scientific research and how do we make that data more transparent and re and make the analysis um, reproducible replicable through by providing um, co consistent access to the research community yeah this this is just a quick follow-up on that I mean who do you think should be initiating these conversations is it the researchers because we have a lot of researchers who are collecting this kind of data um, who have this one-off data, be it from governments or, you know, commercial interests, and and I just don't see the the nece necessarily the incentives on the part of the researcher who's using this data once to write their paper. And so so right there there yeah. is no incentive on the part. Given the current um, environment, um, there isn't a lot of incentive for individual researchers if they can say, oh, 
I signed an NDA. I don't have to share my data. I don't have to do all these things that other, other people are using other data to do. They don't have the incentive. I think that, therefore, that's exactly why the leadership does has to come from organizations like ICPSR. It has to come from, um, federal, um, from federal agencies that are funding research that's using um, proprietary data. It also needs to come from professional associations like the American Economics Association, the, the sociologists, PAA, I mean, all, um, all of those associations that are setting the standards for what constitutes research, um, both um, the Political Science Association has the transparency initiative which is about which is encouraging researchers do we are we talking about the transparency initiative do all of you know about the transparency initiative I don't um, the transparency initiative is well it's its own organization but it's largely supported by the American Political Science Association um, and um, but there are many organizations that are signatories to the transparency initiative and these are the kinds of collaborations of scientific communities coming together to say this is what's necessary and I think as those standards um, are changed then then individual researchers want to align themselves with the standards that are expected by by their professional associations, by the journals where they want to publish, by the funders that are that are supporting them, and then I, so I think that that's part of it. The other piece of it is I actually do think it is easier for many businesses that are um, that would like to. Um, be of public service, would like to collaborate with the research community, but that are not set up to, that, you know, they don't want to have a staff of lawyers dealing with um, the changes that people want in their NDAs. Um, <laughs> watch me roll my eyes. I don't want to deal with that either. But anyway, but it is our, but it is our job to deal with it. And uh, uh, that's why we're, that's why we're working on these template agreements. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Other subjects, yeah. This is a follow-up to that. Um, since you mentioned the transparency initiative, there's also um, the open science movement yep. and the open science folks, and I just wondered um, if there had been any communication with that or if this is, I know that ICPSR is more focused in the social sciences, but has there been a dialogue or um, yes actually we um, we've been in a lot of communication with um, open science and we actually have a joint project which is um, which we are hoping we will hear gets funded um, uh, very soon that will actually allow people using the open science platform to publish their data directly to ICPSR um, the leader of the um, I, I don't remember exactly what his role is, but he's he's not the actual executive director, but the chair of the board of the Open Science um, of Open Science now is actually also very involved in the Transparency Initiative. Is a guy named Skip Lupia, who um, was used to be the director of the American National Election Study, um, which is the which is the study that led to the creation of ICPSR. So these are things which um, these are people that we are interacting with on a regular basis, and we support. Yeah, but thank you for mentioning that. Other, yeah, Peter. <laughs> uh, just a brief update also on proprietary data. I do think that this has also affected that kind of data in some ways in the academic community too. For a long period of time, you know, we've always released, for example, the surveys of consumers that's done right here at the University of Michigan. It's used to, uh, uh, by many, many people, and it's released on a particular day every month. So if you want the most recent data, you have to be a subscriber, and it costs money to do that. But they have historically given us older data, as Maggie has talked about, and for many, many years, we have a kind of embargo that we would not get any data that was uh, less than three years old. But over the last few years, they've started giving us much more recent data. And if those of you who've looked on our website have seen collections that are much more up to date. So I think maybe this push about open access is, not, is affecting proprietary data as well. There is more of an interest and a willingness to share this than ever before, and, and it's getting a bit easier for us to, me, to be able to provide these data to the membership. 
Yeah. Actually, the, the other area where we're working on this is about social media data. And we have a proposal, as I think I mentioned last night, one of our um, new um, faculty members, Libby Hempel, does most of her research on social media data. That is commercial data and we um, and that she that she's that has been made to available to the research public in a variety of ways Libby is working on a proposal um, to sort of improve the data infrastructure around social media data that's particularly challenging because as you know social media data changes essentially constantly so having um, replicable data sets really requires better versioning it also requires large capacity to store large data and and the work that we're doing um, with our that I mean the move to our connects allows us much more flexibility in versioning data and the work that we're doing to move things to the cloud will also allow us to accommodate the larger kinds of data sets that we're um, that we're that we're getting and that researchers are interested in analyzing today. Other things? Okay. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you all very much, and especially thank you to Joanna for organizing.